tonight we're going to talk about something that's been in the news a lot and I was looking back when the last time I talked about vitamin D and what it how it correlates to the ketogenic diet and that's probably been a year since I've done this conversation so I thought oh it's a good time to refresh I'm not going to go through a lot of the things I've gone through in the past but um, I do think some people are really getting beat up for talking about ways to make the human body healthier what is it as uh, I recommend to my patients that we really do dive in and talk about things that are seemingly unimportant like magnesium or zinc or uh, sleep or use of alcohol and one of those topics that is on a checklist and if you're following evidence-based medicine you're supposed to have this conversation with your physician but many times it gets pushed way down the the list and that's the conversation with um, what is your vitamin D level and how does that correlate to your health how does that correlate to uh, your overall improvement for um, not just a ketogenic diet just in general like your risk of cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, your risk of uh, heart disease, your risk of um, dementia, and all of those connections seem like how could that possibly connect to so many parts of the human body? Uh, but when you dive just a little bit into vitamin D, it is clear this is not your average vitamin. This is more like a hormone or a pre-hormone is really what it is, but there isn't a cell or an organ system that doesn't connect with using vitamin D to signal, to grow, to suppress, and all of those um, messages dovetail into when they're working right, the patient is healthier. And we're gonna talk just a little bit more about that. So we're gonna talk about vitamin D, and we're gonna talk about just some of the basic lessons, the kind of lessons I would give a first year medical student, but then also take it into what do I tell my patients? So on the opening slide for vitamin D, I definitely have a sun because the sun is the most abundant source of vitamin D, uh, or at least it changes what goes on in the human body. So those sun rays come from the sun. You've got UVB radiation and UVA radiation. UVB radiation is the specific wavelength that takes this cholesterol-like fat in the body and makes it an active... Um, an active component uh, in the body known as vitamin D. That pre-hormone is uh, again signaling nearly every single patient, or <laughs> every single cell in the in the body. Uh, vitamin D3 is what is active after your immune system or after the sun takes that cholesterol and manipulates it just a little bit. There's two other ways that vitamin D get into the line of our system. One of them is supplements. Um, I can write ergocalciferol, vitamin D2. This really is uh, something as a prescription I could put in 50,000 uh, units pills and those supplements certainly do impact the way the blood levels turn out in patients. Um, vitamin D3, however, the, the cholecalciferol uh, is the part, is the vitamin that's already been activated by the sunlight. So you can think of vitamin D2 still has to be uh, activated a little, uh, whereas vitamin D3 is ready for the next steps in the liver. So once you're in the liver, um, you have some enzymes that uh, take over and change the D3 into 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And when you come into the clinic and we check your vitamin D, this is what I'm measuring. I measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So those blood levels, um, are important but once the blood levels in the in the body are doing well we have two ways it hits the kidney it is measured in the kidney and the calcitrol is um, the actual active uh, uh, pre-hormone vitamin that will change uh, these signals on the cell membranes so you look at um, that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, it is the active form of vitamin D. It is a couple steps beyond vitamin D3. Um, your kidney could also do a couple other things with it. It could turn it into the water soluble form, which um, you would urinate out. So 
there, that's what medical students get to know about vitamin D. Um, so there are four major sources of vitamin D and the UVB radiation or the sunlight is the most abundant. It is your major source. And I am totally guilty of spending the first 20 years of my practice chirping, chirping, chirping about vitamin D, or excuse me, about exposure to sun and the risk for skin cancer, never really taking time to spend uh, or to reflect on how many patients are getting skin cancer and when they get skin cancer, how many of them can we not help? I mean, how many of them are deadly versus um, how many of my patients completely stayed out of the sun because I either had them wear sunscreen or what I did to my kids is I had swimsuits that started at their wrists and went all the way to their ankles. <laughs> yes, they till, still make fun of me for that, but completely covering up their skin, not, act, not getting... Um, the, expecting the source of vitamin D to always be something that was supplemented or that they were eating and not use the major way our body makes vitamin D which is the Sun uh, so number one major source number two fatty fishes vitamin D comes from cod liver oil or mackerel salmon uh, I'm a big fan of sardines and how they are cheap easy safe and abundant um, and those do really have a huge source of vitamin D in them uh, the third place is that you can get food. The government has put fortification into to, to milk, to cereal, and to orange juice. And if you ever forgot which <laughs> foods were fortified, uh, all of the advertisers know this list by heart and they exploit that it is vitamin D fortified, vitamin D fortified. However, when you look at what the transition is from people who have vitamin D to those that are, that are taking vitamin D fortified foods and whether or not they still have a low uh, vitamin D, it's astonishing. It's like, yeah, it makes a measurable difference, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and then finally, there are the supplements, which um, can come from my prescription. They can come from the, um, you know, the over-the-counter. And the supplements uh, are also, again, measurable. But I would contend in the state that we're in, uh, decreasing are increasing your chances of a low vitamin D by having multiple sources of this is gonna be your best bet. Now, when you're looking at vitamin D uh, and where uh, people tend to be low, if you look at population studies, but if you look at who's tends to be low and what kinds of things really do impact the increase of vitamin D, um, you're gonna look on the polar sides of 35 degrees latitude if you live north of uh, 35 degrees in the northern hemisphere or south of 35 degree latitude in the southern hemisphere your vitamin D is gonna be lower statistically um, seasons tend to make a big difference if you live in a city where you don't go outside for four or five months those seasons really do decrease vitamin D and and like many of these uh, vital nutrients um, most of the population lives right on the edge or deficient and as soon as they drop it for a few months, their brain slows down, their energy slows down, and their immune system slows down. Um, time of day from 10 to 2, no, your, your vitamin D doesn't go up from 10 to 2, but that exposure to sunlight between 10 and 2, uh, that is when those vitamin, those UVB rays are the best, and having exposure to that sunlight is super important. When you are in a rainy world, they always pick on poor Seattle for this, but it is true, the people in Seattle have a much lower vitamin D. Of course, they live north of the 35 degree latitude, but they also have uh, weather that keeps them inside quite a lot. Um, as you age, it is harder to synthesize cholesterol. Uh, you know, this evil word that we've all learned to hate, uh, or at least fear, that it's gonna have uh, an association with a heart attack, but really, you, you need cholesterol to make this vitamin to convert uh, your vitamin D and that really is a predictor of health. And then finally, skin pigmentation. I, I mentioned earlier that vitamin D2 will be converted into D3 in the skin. Uh, that UVB ray needs to hit vitamin D2 to, to turn it into vitamin D3 and if you have melanin, uh, excessive melanin or the more melanin you have, the more it blocks that transition, so they are, as a population, lower on uh, vitamin D in their blood. And those are turning out to be really important. So I wanted to point out here, here's just a, the latitudes, where do you live? You can see, um, hopefully find your state here, but we're gonna really focus in that we want 35 on either side of that. So as you look at the globe, what is 35, um, 
35 degrees in uh, the latitudes on either side of the equator, I think it's amazing to see how much of uh, the United States is north of that. You know, it really is. I'm obviously not there right now. I'm totally south of that 35th uh, latitude line. But South Dakota, we are there. We are there all year long and all <laughs> forever and ever. But it really does make a difference when you look at the, um, the health issues that are associated with a low vitamin D. So what are those health issues? What are some of the things that we have learned over the last, um, I mean, they've always, some of these have always been around, but um, a few of these I like to really just take a minute and let you sink in. Some of these have been in the headlines this past week, but especially over the last four months, there's been a lot of attention on, um, again, some of the checklists that a perfect physician's visit would be covering, but many times we are putting out a crisis and getting to these deeper layers of your health prevention or what seem like little issues. Ah, it's vitamin D. They can get it over the counter. I don't need to cover that. But the value and importance of vitamin D have never been <laughs> more of a headline than they have this past week, where they were looking at how the immune function uh, through specific cells called dendritic cells, as well as T cells. And if you remember back into my gut lecture, I talked a lot about the dendritic cells. I've, I've talked a lot about T cells and how important they are for fighting infection. Um, we know that uh, vi vitamin D is correlated to the clearance of viruses. Uh, many of the studies have been done on influenza, but in the last six months with the COVID eruption, uh, vitamin D correlation to the viral clearance of um, COVID seemed to have a higher correlation. Uh, and again, they're small studies. You can't uh, get you know, mixed up with causation and correlation, but man, this is an easy thing to fix. This is cheap. It's really hard to overdo vitamin D. Uh, and especially, it's going to take you a good nine months of excessive supplementation to get too much vitamin D. Um, it also is associated with a reduced inflammatory response. Uh, you look at vitamin D and it really does settle down some of those vacuoles that are filled with cytokines. Cytokines, you might recall that word. I've covered it a few times on the show that cytokines are linked to that cytokine storm where if the virus gets into the lungs and the cytokines get twitchy and start to vibrate, they uh, secrete all of their enzymes, which results in a flood of inflammation and fluid in the lungs. So that's called, that's drowning. <laughs> that's not, that's where ventilators and stuff become really important. But even the ventilators don't seem to have the reversal of, um, the cytokines uh, once they've emptied into the circulation, for heaven forbids, emptied into the area of the lungs. Um, so again, vitamin D correlates with a lower level of interleukin-6. Interleukin-6, low interleukin-6 correlates to a high risk for a cytokine storm, uh, that same process I just went through. And vitamin D affects the metabolism of zinc. We've heard a lot about zinc. Um, uh, we've also heard a lot about uh, copper. <laughs> I think I heard one, one uh, caveat about silver, but specifically copper and zinc, I really, uh, those have very easy to follow pathology or, um, you know, uh, pathophysiology to connecting to vitamin D. And that metabolism of zinc, the use of zinc to protect us from infections, specifically viral infections, it's very easy to process that, but if the vitamin D is missing, that zinc can't do its job. So when people say, oh, you know, you have a cold, take in zinc, and sure enough, you can absorb zinc. But if you're trying to activate it and your vitamin D is low, um, party foul, that's not going to work out for you. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.